what this represents is like how much is the model's loss like decreasing or increasing as a local linear approximation with respect to this like parameter z h. Welcome to part two. We're going to be digging more into the ACDC algorithm, the design decisions, and like kind of where this lives in the space of all possible algorithms. Since mm. I very much think of this as the dumbest thing that could have been tried rather than the obviously correct way to do things. And also talking through some of the baselines you compared to of like other approaches for finding circuits. And yeah, maybe to begin, why do you look for edges rather than nodes? And like, what are the pros and cons here? Sure. So we looked for edges since most of the like valuable contribution of the prior work had come from suggestive evidence of the like edges present in graphs. So when you're able to see like, oh, there's like this group of nodes, which seem to like all feed into this group of nodes, then this process is what like speeds up interpretability because it leads you to make like hypotheses about what certain subsets of nodes are like really doing. And so these edge connections turned out to be like a common way that people did interpretability. Like they would essentially manually do this recursive process going through nodes. This seemed to be like the best way to try and both like emulate how people did interpretability and like provide a tool which could plausibly speed up interpretability. This did have downsides though, because as mentioned previously, the number of edges in the graph is like roughly quadratic in the number of like nodes they have. And since we are like linearly sweeping over edges in graphs, our algorithm gets substantially slower for like larger models, such as even GPT-2 small. So that's a comparison of edges and nodes for automated interp. Yeah, so to me, the like naive way of doing this would have been try to compute a graph on edges, sorry, on nodes, by doing node-level patching. Like you mm -hmm. resample a blade each node in turn, and then once you get the sparse set of nodes, then do something like ACDC on the subgraph of just those nodes. And assuming that like, what, a couple of percent of nodes matter, this seems just, I would expect it to be much faster. I, mean, I haven't run the numbers on this. Yeah, I think this is a little bit faster. One point of note here is that you don't necessarily sweep over every single possible edge, because once you've recursed through this like O node, for example, then we've only found that the incoming A and C connections are the like important ones. And so this would cause us to like never actually visit this node B uh, like at all, at least until we realize that it's the connection into C. So we do go slightly faster than having to sweep over every single possible edge. Though I don't, I'm not even sure if it's like an asymptotic speed up. So the intuition that like speed ups that would just remove some nodes straight away, I think are like pretty true. I think there's like ongoing work that I'm like looking uh, like uh, to supervise, which will look into like what the best speed ups are. But I think the point of ACDC is to be like a very simple baseline to build up, up of, up, like build from essentially. I think one of the easiest ways to describe an algorithm is just to say like, look, the whole end to end process is this recursive uh, resampling of edges. So uh, yep, it seems totally plausible that you can get speed ups with initially removing some like nodes, but I by no means think it's like a immediately doable thing, particularly in the like face of like backup and redundant components, for example. So that was the like design choice to choose a pretty computationally expensive method, because one, it was substantially more simple to provide as a baseline. And like, secondly, it didn't like have like worrying complications about plausibly uh, dropping nodes that were actually important. Thanks. That makes sense. So it's, you're like, well, we know this isn't that fast. We know that this kind of struggles and models bigger than GPT-2 small, but we see this as like the first step and someone should do something here. And when yeah. you have an algorithm that works, speeding it up is like not that hard. I think this like uh, is like the right way of framing things. And a lot of things happening in this paper, by the way, make an interesting interpretability work has been pretty disjoint from, from now, from up, up to now, but let's survey that. And also no one's really like measured how well automated interp is going. So let's do that as well. And the contribution of like, also, we have our optimized algorithm of four steps or whatever would be like another significant like bar. So 
I think that that's perhaps like one of our motivations for not pushing extremely hard on optimizing like the the, the algorithm. And I'm certainly excited about supervising and seeing follow up work for that reason. Yeah, there was a recent hackathon project I thought was very cool called ACDC plus plus, trying to put gradient based approximations in here. Does this speed up? Though I have no idea how well it actually ended up working. But I have this pet blog post called Attribution Patching about gradient based approximations to patching. I'm curious. Does the order that you iterate through the edges going into O matter? So this was something which we uh, didn't find ever mattered drastically. So in early experiments, we tried some like, several different orderings of random edges and like reversed edges, because by default, what we just happened to do was firstly look at the like more like close edges from like a and c for example to the node o and then later recursing to b but uh, this was essentially just a choice and we didn't find any cases in like the bigger models where this was a massive deal but then there was one case which came up somewhat late in the sort of like uh process where we did find that in like an induction model there happened to be uh, two induction heads and it would sometimes matter which one you like found first and so there is some node dependence. So we have like a graph here where like one run on a particular setup would like get this node 1.6, which is an attention head, uh, induction head rather. And another run found like an uh, like this node 1.5. And like our intuition for what was happening here was that layer norms are like everywhere in models and are present just before the um, output connection here. And what layer norms do are they like threshold the output of certain components. And so uh, since uh, when you have like one attention component there, it has like a significantly bigger jump than having uh, like the jump from one to two components. I think that there's like some dependence on which node you run into first in like this like induction case, but uh, otherwise it wasn't a massive deal. Wait, I'm a bit confused by the layer norm point. So layer norm takes the residual stream and it scales it to have unit standard deviation, which basically means you care about the norm of the residual stream. But if you take a head and you corrupt its activations, that seems like it shouldn't change the size of it that much. Like if you're zero ablating, that does change things. Yeah, I guess maybe I'm talking about it in the zero ablation case. Yeah, this is definitely not like, this is just an intuition that I, I think I had that probably this would cause you to like drop the first induction head you ran into, but keep the second. But uh, I'm not certain that this has been um, like verified in this case. But if just the norm is being kept constant, whether or not you ablate the heads, then I think that, yeah, this work wouldn't apply at all. But uh, since this is like a two layer model, uh, I would guess that the norm of the output of the heads is like somewhat large. But uh, this actually probably should be empirically tested because uh, we have different intuitions here. Yeah, and yeah, just to kind of unpack the original question to the order matter, there's like this kind of race condition problem where you look at an edge, you test it. If it's irrelevant, you delete it. And then the next test you do, you've already deleted the previous edge. Mm. And assuming that like sometimes things can be distributed and there can be weird subtle effects, and it's not literally that some edges matter and some edges don't, this mm -hmm. gets kind of cursed, where you have, like, maybe if you have these five edges, exactly one of them matters, but it's like an OR gate, and it just happens mm -hmm. to be the fifth one. Or, well, when you checked this edge, because this other edge was here, it didn't look like this mattered, so you deleted it, but actually it was crucial, or something. And, I don't know, we'll get more later into the various pathological things, <laughs> but... Yeah. It is interesting how weird some shit gets in here. A different line of question would be, how performant is it? How long does it take? Sorry, performance speed-wise. So on these like small models, these like 10 million parameter, I think, or smaller models, it's like feels like almost instant, like it's just uh, done within like five minutes and you can see the sort of like progress as you've iterated through the output node and then the 1.5 node and then the nodes further back such that you're never like waiting around, but it can take between like 10 minutes, I'd say, and an hour for the GPT-2 small runs, which is pretty prohibitive if you want the very large subgraphs. But the smaller subgraphs, like the one shown in like figure one, could be produced in like, I think 10 minutes was about the sort of time to produce a graph 
like the first one there. Huh. Why does the size of the subgraph matter? Um, I think it's because if there are fewer nodes present, like in the final graph, and there are fewer nodes that you end up actually going into to then look at all their inputs one by one. Right. Yeah, I feel like there's some interesting informatics and PID problems about, like, you have a subgraph. 1% of the nodes matter, or 1% of the edges matter. Uh, how long does this take, and what kind of graph search algorithms could you run? You could also try some kind of binary search on the edges, like you remove half and see if any of that matters or something. I feel like there's lots of interesting algorithmic innovation here. I guess we're maybe like spoiling the like future work part slightly, but uh, my current take is that if someone could get like a gradient descent method working, which optimized over like all the possible edges, then I think this would be like some of the most exciting follow-up works because this would be able to like take into account more complex like dependencies between certain edges and doesn't run the risk of like being extremely expensive because of having like a large outer loop. So I'm somewhat like bullish on like gradient descent probably generally being the best way to find these things, but we'll like get into work we compared to that already uses gradient descent, as well as what future work we th I think is exciting personally. Cool. And yeah, are there any other like subtle nuances of the algorithm you think are worth getting into? One problem or subtlety with the ACDC approach is that you can sometimes get dead paths that appear in the algorithm. So uh, if we focus on figure 2a and 2b, we may find that the connection AO is very important because it leads to a downstream change in performance, but we may then later find that we can remove the connections IA, for example, so the two incoming connections to node A, and that neither of these do have like as large enough effect to be included in the subgraph. And so then at this point, you have the like edge AO still present in your subgraph, but all of A's inputs come from uh, like corrupted edges. And so this is one subtlety where the algorithm was somewhat stupid because it included an edge like the AO one, that then it didn't actually connect up to the input. And uh, this has, we uh, like can process graphs to remove these cases, but uh, it's like one irritating thing about this particular ACDC algorithm. Yeah, just digging into that. The fundamental problem there is your criteria for choosing whether to retain a node or not is like this threshold tau. And you can imagine tau is one, A adds 1.5 to the output metric, but mm -hmm. IA adds 0.75 and BA adds 0.75. Mm -hmm. Neither of these makes the cut because in some sense there's some like credit splitting. Yep, that's totally possible. And this is closely related to the question of how like reasonable this whole approach to like automating circuit discovery is because this was a case where there was quite a lot of distribution of like important nodes across uh, like the inputs to the node A here. And so in some sense, it wasn't the right like units to be thinking about the graph in terms of like the node B and node I. They were just part of like a common thing which uh, outputs something into A. But uh, it's not necessarily like terrible in that case, but it's connected to the fact that perhaps your computational subgraph isn't actually that sparse. How important is the tau parameter? In terms of importance, this is like this, obviously if this is like infinity, you will include literally nothing. And if you turn it into like a negative value, then it will almost certainly include like all the edges in your graph. So this like wholly represents the like sparsity of the subgraph that you get out. And so it is a design choice and can be irritating to get the like right level of sparsity, though it is worth noting that because the algorithm is iterative, so you first get to see what are the inputs into the node O that are relevant, and then you get to see what are the inputs that, are in, that go into like node A that are relevant. You can like use the like proportion of edges that go into the output node to then like tune the parameter tau, so that becomes closer to your like idealized number of incoming edges to your nodes. So it is an irritating choice, but there are like heuristics that you can use by like stopping your algorithm early and restarting to like make it not too painful to choose a value tau. Right. It kind of feels like there should be some tau scheduler or something. Oh, I imagine this is one of the other areas where there's like a lot of room to innovate on the algorithm. Uh, yeah. And I mean, imagine, I don't know, 
Uh, you know O matters, so let's take the two inputs to O. Let's put each of them through. Uh, let's say we, we can keep three of the inputs to O and the top three or something. Is an alternative that like might make sense, might not make sense. I don't really know. Yeah, I think it's like it probably does use fewer like hyperparameters than the gradient descent based approaches, which often have <laughs> to balance both like the literal learning rate as well as the uh, regularization parameter for how sparse they force the graph to be, and then like plausibly learning rate schedulers as well. So it's like actually less of an overhead probably than gradient descent, though in the limits, I think the gradient descent methods will provide better ways to like choose uh the the sparsity essentially uh because they uh like they won't need to have specialized heuristic like if as you were sort of mentioning like if there's one useful node then let's ensure we pick three incoming edges or something like that this could just be handled by like gradient descent optimizing over like the different mask values for those nodes so i'm more like excited about the gradient descent approach there but i agree that like i sure hope someone makes a tau scheduler for this because that would make it yeah. more just to use Maybe we need some automated hyperparameter for automated circuit discovery discovery. <laughs> but yeah. So another thing I thought was interesting was like the use of metric you used. Yeah. In particular, you seem to be excited about using KL diversions, which is not something I'd seen used much in Mechanduck before. Mm. Do you want to chat a bit about that? So uh, thanks for the question about uh, KL divergence. So the first sort of point I guess that's worth clarifying is how metrics fit into the ACDC algorithm in the first place. They've sort of been like skimmed over in our discussions so far. They come into play uh, when we are like using a threshold tau to compare the metric in uh, like one intervention on the model and uh, like another intervention on the model. And so what we do is we calculate a particular metric when like the edge BO, for example, is present. And then we can remove the edge BO and recompute that metric from the forward pass of the model and compare those. And then if there's like things get worse by more than tau, we include the BO. So that's like the role metrics play in the like ACDC algorithm. And in our survey of existing work, we looked into what metrics people used, and it was fairly diverse. So, for example, in the IOI task, they look at the logit difference between the John completion, which is good, and the Mary completion, which is bad, as their metric. But in our work, we found that you didn't need to like choose a different metric for every task. And in general, we used the uh, KL divergence to the original model as our metric throughout the work. So that is, we looked at the model's uh, output distribution in a completely clean setting. And we looked at the model's like output distribution in the like corrupted setting. And then uh, we were able to look at, like, given the uh, like two output distributions, what the KL divergence was between them as a measure of like how corrupted our like model had become. And so this then means you can compare two different KL divergences and see if there's like an increase of KL divergence by more than tau to include edges or not. And this turned out to have desirable properties, particularly with regard to like a good hearting, essentially, the metrics that are present in this table. But uh, that's the background on uh, KL divergence Thanks. for this uh, work. Thanks. All right. So digging into a few things there. So KL divergence is like a metric for the distance between probability distributions. And you're saying the model outputs a probability distribution over the next token. We can take the normal thing, and then we can take the thing after we do our interventions, and we can look at the distance between these. And that's a measure of like how much the edges we ablated mattered on this distribution. And the metric is like quite a big deal because the thing you're measuring just is very important for determining what the circuit is. For example, the difference between the John and Mary logit, the logit difference, completely ignores the bit of the model that are computing like this is a name, because those should boost John and Mary equally, while the bit of the model that says this is a name will significantly damage the KL divergence. So ACDC should pick up on that. How do you think about this trade-off? Yeah, I think this is true that uh, the KL divergence does mean you like 
lose something that um, existing works were optimizing for. But I think it does have a number of like advantages that like the sets of metrics here perhaps do not have, such as the fact that in general, if you can get as close as possible to zero KL divergence, you will almost certainly exactly match how the model will do a particular task. But for a metric like logit difference, so how much do particular subgraphs put logits on the John token minus the amount of logits they put on the Mary token, it turns out that models have like a bunch of positive and negative components that both increase and decrease this number, which means it's very possible to get like a very like close logit difference to the original model while including like some large and some small values for that particular, uh, so while like removing some model components that are like actively harmful, as well as removing some that are like actively useful. And so like many roads lead to Rome essentially. And this is not less true with KL divergence. I guess it's like theoretically possible, but it's just like not gonna really happen in practice that you get zero like or very close to zero KL divergence with a completely different subgraph to uh, like the original model's computation. Yeah, I guess you could imagine like some nodes doing a thing and some other nodes suppressing that thing if they exactly cancelled out. But that should look identical on like every metric, assuming it's purely on the logits. But thanks. One another thing which I think is interesting is this idea of like pathological solutions. You were telling me it could get to like 10 logit diff in a really pathological way, in a way that KL divergence break. Uh, like yeah. KL divergence stopped happening. So I was kind of thinking about it as a form of regularization as well. This seems right. Yeah, that uh, I think uh, we have in like the appendix to our work, you can explore the like long sets of results of how these various uh, <laughs> discovery methods do, that certain runs of the like algorithms, including ACDC as well as the baselines, when they search for as like higher load difference as possible, it turns out that they can get the model way like out of distribution into like load differences of 10 and above which was like about twice as large as anything that we manually saw on the IOI paper because of uh, like bizarre combinations, presumably, of like nodes that we think to like suppressing this like Mary prediction incredibly hard that then like lead the models to be just extremely confident in John relative to Mary. So this particular like task, the IOI task, did teach us many lessons about like how we could design ways of capturing circuits that didn't fall prey to these like good heart problems. I think another thing which was interesting about the paper was, as you say, you kind of act as a literature review of like other existing approaches to automated inter, or at mm -hmm. least automated ways of finding subgraphs. Do you want to chat through those and the baselines and how you adapted them to the ACDC setting? Sure. So the two approaches that we adapted to be like circuit discovery approaches, because the field of mechanistic interpretability is fairly small and not really academic, at least up until a few years back, this means that like no one's really tried like there's explicitly written written papers to do auto circuit discovery before but there are just a ton of ml techniques that are super similar and useful for this task and so the first task we compared to was this subnetwork probing approach which was used to learn a mask over the internal model components to find a small set of components that led the model to like have certain representations, I think was the thing they were going for, which was why it was a probing based approach. And so this approach is similar to us in that it's finding some sparse set of internal components, but it differs in like at least two ways in that it was looking for the nodes that matter and it was finding them by doing gradient descent over a mask over those parameters. And so this was subnetwork probing, like our first like algorithm that we adapted and then compared to ACDC. Uh, how did you adapt it? Why did it need to be adapted? Sure. So one of the many like techniques we discussed so far was the uh, patching approach, where what you do is you take like one input distribution and another input distribution, and uh, you like replace activations from the clean distribution with their activations on the corrupted distribution. But this isn't generally done in the ML literature, at least in this like uh, so particular subfield. And they set everything to zeros at all times. So instead of learning a mask, which is either like on or zero, 
we learned an interpolation between it's the clean input or it's uh, the corrupted input. And so that was the like the one of the adaptations made to this method. The other would be that I don't believe they were ever looking for like a minimal set of circuit components to do a task in the vein of our diagram in figure one. I believe they were like looking to mask a number of components and then learn a linear probe to see whether the model could still represent certain like grammatical features, I think, with uh, that like minimal set of components. So we like didn't have any probe here at all. We were just looking for uh, like an end-to-end subgraph rather than like looking into the model's representations. Oh, that's why it's called subnetwork probing. I was very confused. This like work was, um, I mean, it's a pretty cool paper, but it builds many of its techniques from like a much bigger paper called Learning Sparse Networks with L0 Regularization, which was not doing probing, but like doing their methodology, but I believe was using the like sub the mask learning approach through training, like it wasn't doing it post-training for interpretability reasons, but through training in order to like have an end-to-end -end network that was just like quite small uh, at the end. And so there are a number of prior works that are like doing this rough thing, but none of them are quite hitting the nail on the head for automated circuit discovery. And what does learning a mask mean? Like, is this doing gradient descent? So learning a mask means deciding some subsets of uh, like nodes in a graph, and these are just ones or zeros. But in general, you cannot do gradient descent on discrete spaces such as uh, like ones and zeros that are mask values. And so you have to do a continuous relaxation of whether nodes are present one or not zero. There are what like... does a continuous relaxation mean? Good question. So the two things you could do to instead of optimizing for ones and zeros, optimizing uh, like still a mask, but with either values between zero and one that represents like a weight, like a linear interpolation between like the corrupted weight and the clean weight, or you could learn a continuous parameter of a random variable such as you could learn that each mask weight was a Bernoulli random variable with parameter p. And then this is a random variable that is one, so it's like the node is present with probability p and not present with probability zero, uh, sorry, one minus p. And mm -hmm. this Bernoulli random variable, so a Bernoulli p, present with probability p, not present with probability one minus p, is a different way of uh, having a continuous parameter. So the p here represents I a binary value that's either zero or one. And sorry, so there's two things you could do here. The first is linear interpolation, mm -hmm. where you like, rather than if p is 0.6, then you set it to 0.6 times the clean value plus 0.4 times the corrupted value. Mm -hmm. The second is you could sample a mask Mm -hmm. and say with 60% probability I'll keep it in, 40% I'll keep it out. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't know, sample a thousand of those and average. Which one are you doing here? So the subnetwork probing approach uh, does the, like a combination of both, I think is what that <laughs> actually does. So like it uses the sort of a random activation to decide how much it's going to weight the one input versus the other input. And this turns out to be uh, useful because in all of these approaches, at the end, practitioners generally want to round their mask weights to zero or one. Like you want at the end of optimization, nodes to either be present or not, rather than some like linear interpolation between them. And so you can try and get this with just optimizing a continuous parameter and then like rounding it to one or zero, but it turns out it's more likely that you will learn just zeros or just ones by like learning random variables and then clamping those random variables to one and zero. So during training, we are like actually sampling a mask. Yep, that's right. And then just doing a gradient update through that mask in a way that's going to be kind of noisy. And we're using some tricks so that we think we get the derivative with respect to P. Yep, yep. Fair enough. I will class this as weird street optimization voodoo. Yeah, I think there is an elegant idea here that you do, like, there is something that is a little bit worrying 
about learning a continuous interpolation between two values, because this might not represent what you're going for. And so the random variable approach adds some noise so that it's unlikely that the model depends on some superposition between two values, but still you can then do like gradient descent to like find a mask at the end. Uh, but it's worth noting that there's con like concurrent work. There's work from, I think it was Max Lee and Zander Davis on circuit breaking, where they just did the like approach of learning a linear interpolation between clean and corrupted values to reduce toxicity in a model by removing a small number of edges. So these approaches have been tried by like a number of people and uh, they are like quite exciting despite having different properties. Mm -hmm. So to summarize, subnetwork probing, the idea is you want to learn a mask on nodes. And the idea is you're learning a probability of whether you should keep each one in. And mm -hmm. you do some sampling to actually sample a mask and then keep some in, keep some out, run the model, and then see what happens. I noticed that you, you've written SP learns a mask Z and then sets the weights of the network. Presumably here we're operating on activations. Yes, yeah, so that's like adapted because zero ablation is equivalent to um, zeroing out weights, but uh, corrupting by setting to a different uh, activation is not the same as zeroing out weights. So that was like a change from some network cool. probing setup to ours. Ah, that makes sense. And can you do this on edges or is it purely node level? Nope, we have uh, like ongoing work on extending this to edges based on the ACDC library because the approach does work, but it wasn't benchmarked in our ACDC paper. So you're kind of taking the complete subgraph then? Like you yep. find some nodes that matter and you're just like every edge between these nodes? Yep, exactly. Um, cool. Oh yeah, one detail we haven't covered. So there's a copy of each head for each token position. Yep. In ACDC, do you treat these as the same node or separate nodes? So as we've described the algorithm, it's general enough to include that case. In the main text of our paper for evaluations, we are not split by token position, but it has been used by practitioners with our implementation of position splitting. And so this could be one of the most helpful uses of ACDC, which we have a figure of here for a, like a gendered pronoun subgraph for some task yeah. of predicting he versus she that did involve like a splitting by name, but it wasn't part of our main text evaluation of the work. Man, I feel like you really owe PyGraph is a donation. <laughs> using them a lot, but cool. All right, and I think I saw another baseline called his. So What's this would be a good one to discuss because it is very closely related to the gradient-based methods that like you have worked on in like activation patching. So attribution patching. They are very similarly named, but not the same name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. So yes, the gradient method HISP is a method of attribution patching that didn't use corrupted activations, but we adapted. So let's find our just to skim over what is going on here. Uh, what HISP is, is a method of estimating the importance of each head or component in a given model. And it comes from a paper called uh, Are 16 Heads Better Than One, which is a great title because they find that for a bunch of downstream tasks that models do, it turns out you can just zero blades all but one head in several layers and the performance barely changes. And so their work was based on removing a ton of heads from certain layers and developing a method to do that, which is certainly related to the approach we were taking in ACDC, but it needs to be adapted. And what the approach they take is, is they take each of their like model components, such as attention heads, and uh, sticks a like weight on them called like, I think it's ZH here. So we're weighting each attention head's output here. Uh, so instead of like, we're imagining that like the model is computing each like attention head output, for example, and then timesing that by some scalar. And by default in the model, that scalar would be like one. But if you consider that as just like a variable scalar, then we can take gradients with respect to each of those scalars. And so what this represents is like, how much is the model's loss like decreasing or increasing as a local linear approximation with respect to this like parameter ZH. 
And because that's like a linear fit, you can then estimate what the model's uh, loss would be if that head was not present at all, like by zero ablating it. And this is extremely fast because you can do this in one backwards pass, like an estimation of what the model's like loss would be if you had removed uh, that head altogether. Does that make sense as the base explanation of uh, Thanks. gradients? Yep. Yep, that makes sense to me. So the key idea here is like, the end product we want is this binary mask of zeros and ones. But probably it's the case that like, if a heading matters a lot, 10% of it matters a bit, rather than some like magic nonlinear effects. So right. YOLO, let's just learn some continuous interpolation between the clean and corrupted. And mm -hmm. this is probably just fine and probably works, even though it's a bit of principle because this is not actually the intervention we're ever gonna wanna do to the model. That we go learn these and we hope that at the end of training they are like zeros or ones. I mean this is correct but uh, the HISP method just did this once. It just calculated this for all particular heads. Like they weren't learning these over training. They were just like literally calculating the estimated losses when you remove each head in like uh, independently. Oh then I didn't catch quite follow that. Is it like you look at the gradient with respect to ZH and yep. you're just like, multiply that by one to mm -hmm. take a first order linear approximation to what happens if you boot out this head. Yes, yeah, yeah. It's like, that's the oh, interesting. That really is just attribution patching. Cool. Yeah, so that was just like what we were, we were noticing when we were like uh, trying to extend this to like corrupted distributions as well, that you can expand this gradient term with the like the loss with respect to the chi to be the loss with respect to like the attention head output times by the attention head output by like some chain rule. And this approximation is all like trying to estimate the effect of just zeroing out particular components such as heads. But if we were estimating the effect of setting a particular head to its output on the corrupted distribution, you can just replace this like attention head output term here with like the attention head output minus the attention head output on the corrupted distribution. And this is equivalent to attribution patching as I think we note here. Ooh, you cite attribution patching. I'm very flattered. I should mm. go add that to my Google Scholar. But this is, um, yeah, the equivalent approach once you've added in like the non-zero ablation technique, which was explored in this R16 heads better than one paper and then like adapted for circuit just finding here. So that was the baselines you compare to, which both make a lot of sense as different methods. So I am a McIntyre researcher. I'm not an automated McIntyre researcher, but I care about doing circuit discovery fast and well. What should I use? Is ATDC the right method for me? Sure. So we looked at like how performance these uh, algorithms were at recovering the existing subgraphs and across all the tasks, ACDC was most impressive, given that you can compare its like false positive rates of edge recovery, as well as its true positive rates of edge recovery. And ACDC received the like highest area under the curve on this plot for both the IOI and greater than tasks. Though this method was not particularly robust because it did fail in cases such as the dog string case in this example. So that's the sort of evidence for ACDC as like an algorithm compared to the two baselines. Thanks. All right, I'm going to ask you what all of these metrics mean in part three. For now, I want to zoom out a bit and just be like, well, okay, as a researcher in practice, there's like a bunch of things that I care about. There's like, what does this run fast? How hard is this to code? Is there a sound library for this? Or will I need to write this myself? Things like that. And I'm curious if you have takes for those kinds of considerations. Sure. So I think that the current algorithm can take some time, particularly if your goal is to like scale to very large models beyond GPT-2 small. But for models that are at most that size, it's pretty easy to get set up with a task and throw a metric at it and then run our like out like our source code because our source code was like uh, built on top of like the transformer lens library, which I enjoy using Woo! Neil's library. And so uh, <laughs> we developed it to be able to like be used with any model that like has like a usable computational graph, which I think would be like pretty much all of them. 
and it can then just like run with the setup of just defining a metric and a few data sets and then just pressing play and watching the edges get added. And so an advantage of running ACDC is it's an iterative algorithm. You get to see where like the important uh, edges that affect the output are and then the ones that go into the output. And this is like a process that you get to see happening in real time. And it's an advantage to use the library that you get like access to a fully editable computational graph through our library. So you can just edit each of these connections as like a parameter that's either present or not present in our library. So those are the advantages of using just like the ACDC code to be able to find the edges that are present in your like particular transformer models that you're interested in. But uh, still obviously has failure cases like uh, this doc string case was not possible with KL divergence to find the doc string circuit with um, ACDC. But when it is useful, it can rapidly power through models to automate that process. Great. And yeah, we'll have a link to your source code in the description. Thanks for releasing it. Also for building on Transformer Lens, best library. So suppose I want to go and find the key attention heads in a 3 billion parameter model. Do you have a guess for whether this is doable automatically at the moment and like which of these might make the most sense? I mean, if you're trying to find attention heads in the 3 billion parameter model, you should be just using one of the um, baselines that are more about nodes than edges. So uh, ACDC would be too slow to just sweep over edges in this case. But uh, yeah, I think the our broad evidence is that like all of these methods can recover the most important nodes in most scenarios. So my guess is that you would get like fairly good performance by uh, just like running these uh, existing methods on the um, like the nodes of your model. But I don't think ACDC would currently work with the three billion model. Do Do you think one of his or sub network probing is the best thing to try? I mean, I think that like ongoing work that will hopefully make hit like subnetwork probing work on the edges of a model is probably the most exciting thing here. But uh, this is for the particular thing of looking at like three billion parameter models. I think that this is like quite a hard problem since you need to get a gradient descent loop set up. And like, yeah, it's, it's, it's like difficult for that reason. Makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. How fast is subnetwork probing? I'm not sure off the top of my head. I would guess it's done in closer to like 10 minutes rather than an hour. And we haven't extensively benchmarked like the edge subnetwork probing addition to this paper. So uh, the, the jury's out on how fast or slow that is. <laughs> but I, because of the fact it, it absorbs like bigger models better than ACDC, because you don't have to always sweep through a ton of edges. So you just optimize over all those edges at once. I, I expect it has much nicer scaling properties. Yeah, and I guess HISP is going to be really fast because it's just a single forward yes. and a single backwards pass. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, two forwards and one backwards pass, like attribution patching. Wait, is this literally the same as attribution patching, or am I missing something? I mean, like, to be clear, like, the ori original HISP paper... The, the paper just... came first. So, sorry, their paper came before mine. So, you know, maybe this is... Uh, yeah, but they just... Is they attribution just... patching really just their paper? I mean, their, their contribution is, like, zero ablation to, like, figure out how nodes matter. And so it's, like, fairly reasonable to do, like, a the uh, corrupted version of it. And I believe the ACDC++ people, also this is just like the like the same thing as HISP as far as I could tell, but uh, this does uh, like do things slightly differently because they select some threshold for edge size to include, which wasn't how we did HISP, but it's very, very similar. Oh, I thought the ACDC++ were using attribution patching as like a heuristic for finding the right edges or something. Oh, so I think they it's began with like the their search. first... Th their idea was to extend to like edges, which would be something new and different. But th I think they just looked at nodes for the like the time being. Ah, uh, gotcha. Yeah, it's a hackathon project. It's still cool work. So basically, for like large models, probably using HISP or possibly subnetwork probing, ACDC isn't really a good fit for anything that's like GPT two small size or below. ACDC you think is probably the best bet, and you've got existing open source code people can go use. And yep. and we think there's lots of low-hanging fruit to improve the method, and this is very much a first attempt. I agree with all these things, yeah. Amazing. All right, probably wrap up part two there and move on to part three on really digging into how we even benchmark whether interpretability methods work at all.